paint this jewelry and work on her arm some more and her ring. She's gonna be using this picture that she provided to paint the ring right here. And I'm going to be using for the shininess of her bracelet because there's not a lot of detail in the uh, picture in terms of that. So I'm just going to use the reflectiveness of the, the lights in my room and this little piece of lock right here. See how that, that it looks like a, if I you use your imagination, you can see a bracelet right there, right in that curve. And I'm going to make it gold. So I got this little gold card here. <laughs> So I can get the tone from that. So I'm using, this is how you composite a fantasy picture. You know, the background, the snake, the strawberry. Yes, I'm using her face. And then also for the lace, I was able to grab this. It's not the right color. I'm just going to use the black and use this also. So those are my still life images that I'm working from to add to this. And these are the details. So I could say, uh, I can insinuate the lace. You can see like brown in the, uh, like it's like sheer. You can see that already painted in. However, the little, little designs in the lace around the edges especially is not painted. And I want that as a relief. In other words, some impasto brush strokes where that just is a little bit thicker than the sheer. That, give, that will magnify the sheerness of the painting as well. I have the texture in the snake's body too, which is nice. And I'm gonna have a little bit of the texture in a piece of fruit. And of course, some texture in her face to make her skin really feel like skin by the time I finish adding uh, these layers, you know? You can see that I've taken her face through several different changes. Every time her face looks different. It still looks like her, but it looks different. So. That's one of the techniques that I do. I, and then what I'm doing is I'm just trying different looks, see which one I like the most. You know, basically I'm painting her like four times. <laughs> you know, a lot of people would have been finished this painting. Okay, people say, well, you know, like three days ago, it looked great, it looked perfect, done. But that's not the way I paint, that's not how I paint. What I do is I don't know which version, I have all these, I'm looking at the picture, but from the picture, because I'm a human brain and not a camera, I can translate a face multiple ways. So I'm just trying different looks. And I kind of like, because uh, there is, from the original picture, some more darkness. I'm just going to add a little bit more mascara around the eye. I'm going to darken the eyelashes. Put some eyelashes. I don't really see the eyelash texture in the picture she provided, but I can kind of figure that out. So I'm going to put some eyelashes you know, some texture of that in more. So, uh, you know, these things I add, you know, it's going to take this higher. Now, it's not going to look like the photograph. It's going to look like a painting using the photograph as a reference, but it's going to look very realistic. Everybody's going to be look at that and say, oh, that's, Lush, that's Oshun. So, so, um, so today I'm letting some of the more different modeling I did in the forehead and the cheeks and the eyes that paint is still kind of wet. Now I'm going to paint the eyes especially a lot more, do a lot more with that, and also add some more patinas to her, her uh, complexion and her face, and just some more modeling and some more glazing in that. However, today I'm going to focus on this part I have not really been treating. I haven't treated that. The paint is so thick on the snake, that's going to take about a day or so more to dry. It's like... Um, uh, you know, I wanted to give her, you know, a good painting, you know, and like I say, I don't paint for the dollar amount, amount that a person pays. I paint, all of my paintings are going to be a million dollar painting. I paint all my paintings like they're worth a million dollars. So with that said, that means that you're going to get extraordinary value. Not only that, you're going to get a museum piece, an art piece. You're not going to get some typical portrait. You can go to some typical person. So, oh, it's an oil painting. Uh, you're not going to get that. You're going to get actually a piece of fine art from me because I am a degree fine artist and that's what I do. And I don't want to make a typical painting. I want to make a painting that is like my other painting. So without too much further ado, I am going to start working on this painting. Now, I don't want to get too much paint on my painting. I am going to address this background over here a little bit more. 
and maybe some of the water over here and then maybe her hands over here too, especially when I get to the ring. But I think since I am left-handed, I am going to work, oh, I just dropped my brushes. I am going to work right to left. So I do the opposite of right-handed people. Uh, when you're writing, of course, the convention is to write left to right because most people are right-handed and that's the way they teach you in school. But as an artist, I'm not really writing, I'm painting. And I'm the artist, so it, the, the, the end person is never going to know if I paint left to right or right to left. So I paint according to the left-handed way of thinking, <laughs> which is right to left. So that way I'm not dragging my hand over wet paint. This paint will be dry, but that paint over that side would be wet. So with, with that said, I'm going to start first working on her ring. Ooh, working on her ring. And just add some details to the ring, um, which is right here. And as I'm working on the ring, I'm going to touch up some of the tones on her, on her hand, on her fingers. That's dry. And, uh, you know, and further embellish that paint as well. And to do that, I'm going to start out with my Escoto brush. My Escoto brush, I'm sorry. I'm going to start out with my Escoto brush. And this is the number zero. Uh, I'm also, and this is my, and then also I'm going to use my Raphael number two round. These are both sables. And then I'm also going to use my Renaissance Cat's Tongue Filbert brush number one. But for right now, I'm going to start off with my Escoda uh, number zero. And uh, this is, I already have a block color down, which is which is uh, white, so I'm going to start off with black. People say, well, you don't paint black. Well, when you paint metallic things, especially metallic things, you really should paint, use black. Um, now, I'm not going to just use, just as quick as I said use black, I just added some Doxodon purple to that color and a little bit of ultramarine blue, just that fast. So I said it because I see just as I said that, I look down at the picture and I see those colors in that dark tone. And what I do is I do tend to paint what I see. So I'm going to go into the shadows and right now it's just blocked on and I'm just going to paint the relief of the shadows. Now, this is some very detailed work. So what I'm going to do is I'm not going to hold my palette just to get my arms more free. And I really don't want to hold my example. So I'm going to kind of sit that. Um, I'm going to kind of sit that uh, and I'm going to use my paint stick. This is my new square paint stick. And I kind of discovered this by actually just made it real quick. It's just a piece of scrap wood. I just sanded it down a smidge. That's all I did. I didn't add any tape to it to soften it up or anything. And I'm going to take that mixture, which is basically I guess it's now less of the black and more of the Doxodon purple. And a lot of times I put the black in it just to make it more opaque. It's Mars black that I'm using. And I'm just starting with the, with the, really with the shadow and just building that. And now at this point, I'm really trying to make some exact lines. I'm really not trying to paint very gestural at all. I'm doing what you call wrist painting. Whenever you see me using this stick, usually I'm painting details and I'm wrist painting. Now, wrist painting is basically not using your elbow, your shoulders. Oftentimes, artists use their whole body, especially the elbow and the shoulders, uh, when they paint because they're getting a very, uh, I mean, when I say artists, I mean professional artists, seasoned artists. Artists have been painting a lot tend to paint with the whole body. Now, if you're painting these little teeny paintings, that's different. You're sitting down, you're probably going to be a wrist painter. Just by virtue. Right now, I'm sitting down, but I am not a wrist painter. I am definitely a full body kind of painter. Uh, now, when I do paint wrists, is when I'm painting details and I use this stick. Oftentimes, when I paint, I am standing. I am not sitting at all. So right quickly, I can see with this uh, filbert brush, even though it's a number zero, it is a filbert cat's tongue. 
It does have a nice point on it, but it's just not pointy enough, and I need these little small lines. So I'm gonna go to my number two, Raphael brush. I'm gonna get that same color. Get the paint really nice and ju juicy. I'm getting the Oxidon Purple, Ultramarine Blue, and a little bit of Blars Mars Black. And Because what I need is these really fine little lines of the bands. Just little fine lines of the band. And really, I'm not even really trying to paint the lines. I'm trying to paint the negative space between the jewelry. And since jewelry sits so close to the finger, I'm mostly painting the space, the shadows behind, underneath the ring. I'm not actually painting the ring. I'm kind of painting, at this point, around the ring because there's really no black in the ring. And so the first thing I'm doing is I'm kind of, what I call, what a lot of artists call, and what you used to call this in art school, is you're kind of cutting out uh, the positive space by painting the negative space. So you literally are cutting out your image with this dark tone and separating it from the background. In this case, the very near background is the ring finger itself. <clears throat> okay, so now that I have that kind of separated out and I kind of have a place, positive space, a place for this um, color to exist, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go now and shift and add a little bit of white to this color and that's gonna kind of give me sort of like a neutral gray actually. And I really don't want a neutral gray, so I'm going to go back to the dachshund on purple. And I'm going to cool that gray up with that dachshund on purple. And I think what I'm also do, going to do is get some ultramarine blue as well. Well, see, that, that neutrals it. That kind of makes it more neutral. And, I'm, and the white that I'm using is titanium white, actually. And back. Yeah, that's pretty good. I like that tone there. Now this is a very dark gray and now with this darker gray I'm going to start really trying to paint some of the geometry of this ring. I'm not really going to paint any shadows. What I'm doing is just where the bands connect to the, uh, I think it's a marquee cut ring. I'm just going to start getting some of that the geometry organized now. And I'm trying to paint just the ever so slight line. I do not want this line as dark as those shadow lines because this is the actual ring to separate those elements of the marquee cut. And now that I have the marquee cut somewhat separated, I am, I've already separated the bands and now I'm going into the center. The outer part of the band is pretty straightforward. It's just some bands with some little filigree on it. And then the inside has uh, a bunch of solitaries in there. So different size solitaries going up the side of the band. So I'm gonna go back to that gray that's kind of leaning toward Doxodon purple. And it has a little bit of ultramarine blue in there. Just kind of like a cool gray. And what I'm gonna do with that is I'm gonna start, and I'm also a jeweler actually, those of you that didn't know. So there's a little piece of the jewelry that actually holds, a little rounded rectangular set uh, piece of the jewelry that actually holds the solitary. So I'm going to kind of paint the body of that, get that separated some. On the other side, um, I'm going to, now I'm going to lighten this color up just a little bit, but just adding a smidge more of um, titanium. And I'm going to go to the other side and I'm going to start um, actually painting the band that's on the opposite side of the, of the, uh, the solitary, uh, a motif that's going up the center of the of the band that goes toward the marquee. So I'm going to paint highlights and it's going to be like a middle 
gray, very similar to the gray that I use, because this is going to be the darker tones of gray in this band. I'm trying to paint that where I see it now. These are little small little details. And, and according to the size of the painting, pretty small details um, in terms of, uh, you know, the size of the painting. I try to get this printed and blown up as big as I could so I could see it better. But, you know, uh, okay, so I'm establishing kind of like a, I guess it's about a, it's like a 40% gray. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in here and I'm just going to kind of make the little piece of uh, metal that the solitary is sitting in, just a little perimeter of that. These are just very fine little separations of uh, elements here. You're not talking about anything really, really big here. All right, and now I'm going to actually go a little bit of more make another slightly lighter color and this is about a 30 percent gray adding more titanium to this color and i'm just going to start kind of um drawing the circles for the solitaries and that might be just a little bit too light so i'm going to go back to this 40 percent and kind of make something like a 35 percent gray yeah and i'm starting to paint out those little solitary diamonds. And I'm counting at least one, two, three that I can see, maybe a fourth one. And I'm going to go to the other side where I can count more. And just basically I'm kind of separating the space. You know, because the first thing I like to do is block off everything. So get a place where everything can live in the painting. You know, you got to have space for stuff to fit inside of. You don't want to just start painting and then you get there and say, so, ooh, it's, well, <laughs> that's not going to fit in there. You know? Now I'm going to go back to the original dark tone that I had and I'm going to kind of mix a, like a 75% black out of that ultramarine blue tone, the oxidon purple, and titanium white. And I have quite a bit of medium in, so because I want it, I want the paint to be fluid enough so it can flow and paint smoothly. And I'm gonna go back to this band, and I'm gonna start just adding some of the uh, specular. Well, actually, the you know the reflectivity that's on it. Just gonna add some of that. You know what I see. I might have started this band out just a little bit too thick, thicker than what I actually see there. And that's okay, because I can always small things up. I just paint around more of the negative space. Okay. All right, so now that I have that, I just wanted to add some of that space. Because sometimes what I do when I'm working like this, I'm squinting my eyes and I'm really looking for values. And I don't want one item that I'm working on to throw off the values of another item that I'm working on. Okay. So now I'm going to go back and mix like a 50% gray. So I'm going from the 75% making a 50%. And I really don't really need that 50%, but I'm going to go back into those solitaries and just hit it in certain areas where it's darker at. You know, again, it's the negative areas. And what that's going to do is starting to make the solitaries pop out. You know, giving them more of a 3D kind of a look. Okay, and now I'm going to go back to that 40% with the 50% and make it about 45. <laughs> In doing that, that's what it does, the effect. I'm going to load up my brush really nice and try to get a nice pointy tip by kind of spinning the brush as I get some paint. And now I'm going to start painting the cut of the marquee. Just a little different facets. And basically they're just elongated triangles. Essentially that's what we have is many, many different little elongated. And what I'm doing is I really want to paint the triangles closer to the edge first. 
along the perimeter. Even though I did start out with one of the triangles towards the middle because it was a very obvious one. Now I'm going to do is go back to the lighter one. And now that I have about three or four triangles in a darker tone, I'm going to make some other little facets, which is, you know, little triangles. And now I'm going to make up about three or four more different tones. I'm going to basically have like different degrees of 10%, 5% difference in these gray tones to get the various different facets that you would see in this marquee cut ring. And, you know, like again, it's going to be a range of tones, you know, ranging everywhere from about maybe 25% gray. And, of course, the block color is not pure white. It's like 5%. You know, it's got some other colors, but it's not like 5% would be zero, you know, no values at all, no tone. So the next lightest tone I'm using it's like 20 some percent. Okay, and then once I get enough of those, I go back to this like 75 percent. I add some more white to it, make it about 65. Actually, I'm going just back and forth randomly, just mixing basically what I see. I don't know what percentage it is, but I'm just seeing other little geometric shapes now. And so, what I'm doing is I'm going to paint those little, those little shapes in. Sometimes it's not just a, a triangle. Sometimes it's like a trapezoidal shape. Other times it might look more like a square, you know. Other times it might just make, make it look like a little glint or line. But all of this comes together to create the illusion of a multifaceted diamond. Cut, you know, with many, many facets in it. Then sometimes inside of a triangle, there will be another slightly smaller triangle here and there, or little glints of facets. Also being sure, pay attention to the edge because uh, a lot of times these facets will drop right off the edge. I mean, they don't just come to the edge and stop, but they almost appear to kind of come off of the edge of the diamond in some, in, in some places, some instances. Okay. And that diamond is starting to get, and it, what, it, what makes the diamond is not just the white, you know, because everybody knows diamonds are clear. But what makes the diamond is the, diff, the darks. <laughs> you know, the darker it is, the, the whiter the white tones is going to look. The whiter the white tones, the darker the dark tones, and, and etc. It's very interesting how that works. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go reinforce some of these shapes I made earlier because I think one of the bands could be just a little thicker, so that's good. And now that I have that, I'm going to wipe this small brush because I'm going to be doing a lot of painting with this. And just cleaning the brush, that way I don't have to have so many little brushes to clean at the end of the day. Even though little brushes are easy to clean, I don't really mind those. It's just that the big brushes, oh my gosh. They, you know, they're just a little bit more work, a little bit more time. And oftentimes when, I, when I'm at the end of my painting day, I'm tired. I just want to relax or go to bed or something like that. You know, just sit and kind of chill, you know, have a chilly one and lay low. But I can't because I got to clean my brushes. And, you know, I, I don't buy the cheapest brushes. I don't, I'm not a person who, who, who thinks buying cheap brushes is a good idea because I do paint details, you know. And truth be told is those cheap brushes make your painting job harder, <laughs> not easier. And what you want to do as a painter, you want to really try to find every resource you can to paint easier, to make your job easier as an artist. Because it's hard enough to paint. But painting ain't easy. I'm just going to tell you, it's not easy. 
Now, I know that some people can make it look easy. Some people tell you, oh, it's easy. Well, it's easy. Everybody will be painting. Just like, okay, I can learn how to read. Most people learn how to read. <laughs> but most people don't learn how to paint. <laughs> Have you noticed that? Some people learn how to paint at a young age. Likewise, some people are maestros on the piano. They learn how to play the piano at a young age. Whereas other people just couldn't even phantom. You know, they're just grateful that there is a person who can make music for them when they need to. Likewise, some people are very happy that there is a person who can make their creative endeavors when they need those made in terms of visual creative endeavors. Of course, music is creative as well. There's many creative arts that we do as human beings. And now I'm going to start painting in on the band some of the middle tones, which really reside right next to the dark tones. I mean, they're really just touching and kissing right on each other. And they're just thin little, small little thin little pieces of details. Almost barely being able to see some of these middle tones, just a little small streak of tone, you know, just an ever so thin line. And often when you have these geometric bands like this, your painting does get linear. You know, most of the time, you, you don't want linear because it doesn't look natural. It doesn't look, uh, doesn't look, you're not creating the illusion of like, say, for a person's face, you know, you don't want to be too mechanical with that. So, uh, but when you're painting something mechanical, you can be mechanical cool because you know that you want to take on the you want to take on the personality of the thing that you're painting, and it's a piece of mechanical uh, device. It's a ring. It's a, it's, it's a man-made construct, and therefore uh, you would probably want to paint it just like it's a man-made item. You don't want to tackle that. The same way you say, oh, this is this person's face. So I just want to hit these brush strokes a little short, choppy brush strokes. So just blend, smooth, smooth, blend, smooth, blend. You don't want that too much. You really want to have very high contrast, very mechanical brush strokes, very deliberate, very... Uh, is you want to start moving your body and hand, well, that's why you use your wrist and a painting stick because you want to start you you're, you want to start moving your brush in a very mechanical way to mimic the type of shapes that you're making and the type of lines and elements that you're painting essentially when you paint that's what you're doing when you get something that's more when you're painting something that's more organic you're using your body because your body is organic when you paint something more mechanical you use the mechanical devices because you're painting something mechanical okay then oftentimes when you get black in the play you need a small brush you can't do it anymore because uh, you can but you got to spend a lot of time cleaning brushes I don't really want to do that I really want to spend my time putting the paint where I need it to go, specifically. So I'm going to find my next smallest cat's tongue brush. And uh, I think I'm going to use this Renaissance number one. And I'm going to go back to white and grab some titanium white here. And just hit one of these diamonds. A little glint there. And what I'm doing now is I'm kind of building up 
a shape and kind of separating the diamond just a little bit. You know, instead of just having a negative space, I'm painting now in a positive space. Now, this is wet on top of wet. And this can get messy if you don't go in really nice and surgical and try to hit those shapes. And what I'm really doing with this, I'm just trying to clean up any shape. But also, that does have a tendency to make the, 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 the object that you're painting, it makes it look more three-dimensional because the paint builds up, you know. And, you know, and you can almost sculpture with paint. If you really know how to use impasto well, you can almost sculpt, you know. You can almost just kind of sculpt a, an element, you know, like a ring or a snake's texture or forest leaves or whatever. You can almost sculpture those into play. You don't have to paint them. Or you might not want to think of it like you're painting. You might want to think of it like you're sculpting. Okay, so now that's starting. It, and I don't want this to be too much impasto here because, again, this is mechanical. So I'm just going to kind of clean up some of this brush stroke in here because I kind of globbed a big piece of white there. I probably should have let that negative and just let that dry. But instead, what I'm going to do is just paint it and then smooth it. Then I'm going to let that set up for another session. So I have at least my modeling tones down inside of this ring. I'm not going to paint any white because that all those grays need to dry. Then I'm going to come back with some more grays and build up that diamond. But for right now, at least the basic diamond shape is starting to come forward. You know, that's starting to come forward a smidge. And that is really what I'm looking at. That's really what I want. I'm going to just do a little bit of wet on wet here. With the outside of this. Kind of bring that in just to add a little bit of uh, uh, reflexivity to this. And then also how this goes around her finger. It's going to create a little bit more of the illusion of going around. Like it's around her finger, not, not on top of her finger, but around. Okay. So that looks pretty good. And now I'm going to smooth out a few imperfections that I'm seeing. And I just added with that little bit of painting by accident. It was just a miscellaneous brush stroke that kind of got away from me. But I don't want more brush strokes getting away from me. So that's it. That's wet on wet. I don't want to do too much with that because I don't want my brush strokes to start getting out of control with that. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is. Um, just that fast, I'm kind of finished with that. However, not totally finished because it just looks like a piece of that ring is there. Because this, this, her fingers are open on the example, and it's closed here. So there should be some shadows here. So I'm going to go into a little bit of raw umber, a little bit of that, a little bit of Mars black, and some Doxodon purple. I think that's raw umber. What color is that? and pick up a little bit more and I'm just going to paint some shadow in around this finger. Paint how it would actually look when her fingers closed. Not necessarily how it looks on the paper because there's no shadows there because the fingers are open. So I'm just going to kind of help the illusion of being on her finger. There. That's it. That's better. Need some more shadow in here. There, that's it. And now I'm going to tone that. I think I'm going to tone it by just grabbing just a little smidge of raw umber because I'm not sure. Some of that raw umber is from yesterday's palette. Sometimes my colors get a little bit mixed up. And it might be Doxodon purple mixed with burnt sienna. It might not be raw umber specifically. But I want it specifically raw umber. So I'm going to put out a little, little bead of raw umber paint. 
And what I'm going to do is use that raw umber to create a shadow. And I have some white in this all small brush, and that's okay because I don't want the shadow to be really, really dark. And I am going to mix some <laughs> burnt sienna in there just to kind of warm up that raw umber some. And I'm going to add a little bit of um, alizarin in there as well. It's just going to give that brown just a little bit more attitude. And, uh, and then I'm going to touch right into the shadow with that and try to get the shadow to kind of go into, blend into her skin tones a little easier with this really dark brown. And I'm kind of treating this almost like a glaze. I don't want it too, I'm not putting it on too thick. And I am painting this with this round brush just so I can kind of put these tones exactly where I want them with this paint. You know, razor precision where I want it to be. And I'm kind of touching that dark color a little bit too. Okay, and then I'm finished with that. So now what I'm going to do is go with the burnt sienna color a little bit more. And just mix a little bit of that color that I have into the burnt, so it's just not straight burnt. And I'm just going to add a little bit more tone of the finger into that shadow around the box. Again, what I'm trying to do is create the illusion of the shadow on her finger. Okay, so now that I have that, that's pretty good. I'm going to switch brushes because I need something that gives me a little bit more pushback. So I'm going to switch to a very small number two filver, Raphael. Uh, and I'm really going to start mixing the tones of the finger again. And to do that, I'm going to go back to my white and get a little bit of that on the palette. First, I'm going to start building with the light the highlight color. And I'm going to mix a little bit of cadmium orange in that and a little bit of cadmium red. Kind of get a sort of peachy pink kind of color. Then I'm going to shift that a little bit with a little bit of alizarin. And, you know, give a nice little pinky peach color which is going to be like my highlight tone. A little bit more orange because I want it warm. Don't want it too. There, that's it. And some more of that alizarin. Perfect. Now that's getting in the zone. Okay, I'm going to make a lighter tone of that by adding a little bit more white in there. So I have a darker version of that peachy pink for my highlight. And I have a darker version. And um, looking at my examples, and I just have, I'm getting space challenged, but mostly just looking at my painting. And at first I thought I needed that darker tone more, but now I'm going to need a third tone. I'm just create that by adding a little bit of burnt sienna into that. I'm using a brush, by the way, to mix these tones. And then a little bit more alizarin. Okay, that's great. So now I actually, not three, but four different tones. Basically the same color, just lighter versions. Just so I can lock in on this highlight that's previously existing in my painting here. That's nice. I just get a little wet paint right there. I'm going to go back out to the lighter version, paint around these knuckles. Now I also see a different tone in my highlight. This is more like a beige. So I'm get a little white and yellow ochre. Mix that over to the side and then mix a little bit of this peach into it. And that's going to just kind of warm and then make a second tone of that by adding some more white. And that's going to create just a little bit more of a warm highlight. 
which I'm just gonna also exist on this knuckle. That's nice. Okay. And then now I have a darker version. I'm gonna get some cadmium yellow and some yellow ochre. I'm just building off of that one tone, but I'm building all my little colors on the color pile. And these are just small little colors because I'm painting such a tiny area. You know, you get used to not wasting paint <laughs> once you paint a while. I see people online just painting out these, give them examples, I guess tutorials, these huge swaps of paint just to mix a little tone in the face. I said, what a, a waste. But I think, I guess the video, the, the demonstration is more valuable than the paint or the painting. What they're doing with the demonstration is their value, but oh my gosh, it's so wasteful. And as a painter, I just see that as extremely wasteful, you know. So I'm matching these tones here. I'm just making a little swatch for each one of these little existing tones that's dry. Because what I want to do is I'm, this is kind of like a glaze, you know. That's how you would do a glaze. You would just mix tons of existing tones that's already on your paint. It's already in your painting. And I'm doing that just by using several colors. Uh, titanium white, uh, cabin yellow light, yellow ochre, cabin yellow medium, cadmium yellow orange, cabin yellow red, uh, burnt sienna, uh, alizarin crimson, and yellow ochre, and a little bit of dachshund purple. And that's kind of how I do this particular skin tone that I'm working on here. Uh, you know, what I, what I consider, that's my, it's my palette for whenever I'm doing African American or African, I should say, skin tones. Because they're subtle, but there's tons of colors in the skin tone. Some people don't see those colors. And then other artists, especially artists that tend to be African Americans, we see it because every time we look in the mirror, every time we look at our friends, we see them, you know? You know, artists paint what they see the most. So if you're, if you're an artist, but you're Caucasian, you're going to see Caucasian tones better. If you're African-American, you're going to see probably African-American tones better. Maybe you won't. If, if you're not a good artist, you ain't going to see any tones. <laughs> you're going to be like, oh, what are you talking about? I'm just going to paint it brown. <laughs> you know? You're going to be painting brown, you know? Oh, that's brown. Oh, okay. That's brown. So that's what you're going to do. So it really depends on how sophisticated you are as a colorist, as an artist who mixes color. And if you're a painter, you're going to have to, especially an oil painter or acrylic. Actually, yeah, oil and acrylic. You're going to be a colorist by virtue of being that. There's no way around it. You're going to get good at mixing color, or you're going to make a lot of sucky paintings. <laughs> but if you make enough sucky paintings, you'll get good at it. I assure you. So keep making your sucky paintings. Nothing wrong with it. And then over here, I'm just going to add some of these tones. And so the whole idea is, what I want to do is keep matching different tones as glazes. So I can kind of blend those glazes into this ring. So it looks like one cohesive bit of painting. And, uh, and it looks kind of rough right now, but usually once you get, once I get my key tones down, I go to a blend brush and I start blending and knocking some of those islands of tones down into one more cohesive consistent set of tones. Now, I think I have some zinc white on here from yesterday, but I can't remember which one is zinc white, so I guess I should put some zinc white out here. But I usually save the zinc white to when I'm blending. I don't like to start using zinc white too soon. It's like, it's like that's my like secret, uh, my secret ingredient that I <laughs> kind of add, you know, towards the end, you know, when I need it, kind of like Underdog. I don't know if you guys remember that uh, cartoon. Underdog, he could fly, he could do everything, but he had this little ring, 
Whereas when he really needed, kind of like Popeye, you know, he was pretty tough, but when he really needed it, he would get that spinach. And he was really bad when he got that spinach, man. The underdog had this little ring, this little pill in it. <laughs> and when he needed that extra power, man, he would tap that little, little ring open, get that little underdog pill, man, and then he would just beat the bad guys all, I mean, just tear them up, man, you know. I mean, just go to town on, you know. <laughs> oh, that was some good cartoons, man. But uh, I, I digress into my childhood a bit, I guess. Uh, you know, I guess everybody's entitled to a little something, something. Okay, so now that I have some of this, I'm going to get some more uh other tones here oh i don't want too much sometimes i just put because i'm gonna do a lot of mixing on it i think i'm gonna do a lot of mixing on the canvas but i try to stay away from that i try to pop down as the best my closest that i can get you know but sometimes i kind of know where the colors are going to go you know so i can just put it on and just get a blend brush and then blend this bad boy. Now, I have a lot of um, bright brushes, you know. In other words, shorter brushes. They're sables, but they're shorter hairs. And they blend really nice, but sometimes I like the longer hair ones better. And other times I like the shorter hair ones better. So, in this case, I don't mind the shorter hair one. It's kind of cooperating. When they don't cooperate, I mean, I don't like them. But when they do exactly what I want them to do, then I like the brushes. I guess that's how everything is, you know? If something does what you like, then you like it. If it doesn't do exactly what you want it, then you start hating on it. <laughs> you know? So I guess it is what you make it, you know? It is what you make it. That's what I always say. I'm going to use some of this tone to kind of um, accentuate and separate this hand a little bit more from the garment or from her body. Just to make a little bit of a... Now, I was dry brushing it. Now, I just added some medium to it to kind of make a much more prominent line. But I don't want a major line. I want a minor line. And then what I'm going to do is get a little bit of Doxin on purple, a little bit of raw umber. I'm gonna knock the other side of that line back down, smoothing it into a previous dry color, just to get it thinner, just a, just a, just a really a silhouette of a line, just so enough that you can kind of see where the garment is and where the the the, um, the hand is. So I kind of have some, some, just to make that line a little bit less, a little bit more, more pronounced, I should say, not less than anything, more pronounced. Okay, that's good. All right, I'm going to take the same darker tone and start working with these shadows now on this finger here and these random colors that I kind of threw in, starting to blend them. 
and work them into the other tones. And then once I get something kind of like I like, I'm gonna put a little bit of like white with ultramarine blue in it just to kind of cool this down some, to cool my highlight down. And then I'm gonna go into this kind of like tanny color and just kind of hit it with a cool light tone just to pick up those highlights, but I want the highlights to be cool. I don't want the highlights to not be cool as I'm blending them into the browns, the various, it's not browns, it's these different tones that create the illusion of the skin, I should say, on the finger. By the way, this whole hand is totally made up. The hand is not an original picture. <laughs> I just made it up and put it in here. I wanted her to send me a picture of her holding a piece of fruit, but she never did. Or maybe she was working on it. I was too impatient. I don't know. But I just went on ahead and just did this. Because when I'm conceiving my designs, I just got to move. I can't just, can't just wait around and wait around and wait around. I could, and see how I created that modeling there? See, I put those different tones on, and then what I did was, man, I'm going to do the same thing over this side so you can get an idea of what I've done. And this one is with the one with the ring on it, so I'm going to I'm gonna use, and I'm going to hit a little bit of lizarin. Sometimes I pick up a little color on my brush if my tone is too muted or grayed out just to heat the color back up some more, keep my colors vibrant. And then also I see a little bit of raw umber, but I'm putting a little cadmium in burnt sienna, but I'm putting a little cadmium red in that burnt sienna. And then when that gets a little too bright, I hit it with a little raw umber, knock it down some. And just enhance, try to enhance that tone. And these are just glazes. It's not, I'm not trying to put anything in really, really intense. I'm just really just trying to complement what's already, what I've already painted and just build it up with a glaze. Okay, so now i kind of gone into the back of the hand. And whenever you do that, well, you got to address it because you don't want one part that looks freshly painted and the other part looks like there's no attention been paid to it. And of course, I would probably glaze this with a bigger brush, and that's what I'm going to do. I didn't want to have to break out a bigger brush, but as you can see, I have to break out a bigger brush. I'm going to go to my number six. Uh, I believe this is a filber. And I'm just going to... Really, these are so dark, I can almost try to dry brush them into the existing tone, but I don't want to. I think I... I Always look better when you paint into the existing tone. Sometimes you can dry brush and get away with it, but I think it might be a little bit, I don't want to paint lazy. I'm not a lazy painter. So, not just, I'm just gonna glaze in there. I'm gonna glaze it on in. Okay, the glaze is basically a very thin layer of paint slightly translucent on top of another layer of paint or two or three and essentially what you do is and my fact I'm have, this brush is still too tiny I'm gonna get some dots on purple because this tone gets very dark down here I want to build this with the glaze and I don't want it to get wispy and wimpy I don't want my hand to suddenly start looking gray don't want that. That's no good. But I'm going to have to get a bigger brush. And I'm going to get this number 12. It's a bright, but it looks like a flat brush. And then I'm going to blend this stuff in with it. Yeah, and just kind of heat. Kind of heat this hand up just a little bit. 
I say heat it up just adds more warm tones in that in that in it. Try not to take away from what I've already put in there. Then in some places you don't want the warm tones. You do want the lighter tones that you've already previously established. You don't want to take anything away from something that took you time and energy to build in previous sessions. So I'm going to go back in there and glaze something in there also. And that might even pick that up out of that background just a little bit better, so more. And sometimes you don't know until you do something like this and says, okay, that's not in the original drawing, but you may like the separation better. And in this case, I might. So now that I just added that in, I want to go paint it better because I'm not in a gestural position now. I'm in the final details position. So I want some... I want this to paint be painted better. So I'm just going to get down in here a lot tighter and paint a little bit more meticulous than I would. It's a lot tighter, I should say. There. And I do just want a nice, tight little edge in it. I don't want a whole lot. I want it to cover, though. I don't want it to be at this level. I don't want any of my paint wispy or wimpy at all. Nothing that's, that's showing streaks of the brush in it. But I don't want streaks of the brush. Okay, so now that I have that, I'm going to go back to this other brush. And I'm going to pick up darker tone and again I'm going to just kind of cut that down because I just don't want that much of a light I just want just enough to have that separation in there and just a little bit of modeling so there is some 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 wet darker tones already down and what I'm doing is just pulling those down into this lighter tone and that's taking away the wimpiness of something of some of that paint that I had there but it's still allowing still enough of that lighter tone to still be there so it separates the hand away it just cre creates that little bit of specular highlight on the edge of that arm to kind of pop it away to pop it away okay okay now I'm going to wipe my brush on my trousers of course Make some raw umber, some Doxodon purple, ultramarine blue, and some Mars black. And put it right next to that highlight tone. And I'm going to focus a little bit more on, on burnt sienna also down here, closer to it. And just knock it down. Create a little bit of a silhouette out of it. And I'm going to go to some cadmium orange because I just want a little glow. With some skin glow here. And I'm just going to kind of scumble into this wet on wet now. Or just kind of glaze in a little bit of that, a little bit of glow color in there. I kind of like the glow thing, so I'm going to follow a piece of uh, anatomy of the bone that kind of is in the hand there. Up and just glaze that in. Also, I'm gonna glaze some of that into my highlight too. Just add a little bit more warmth in there. And occasionally, I'm gonna look at my example picture <laughs> because I'm making this all up my head. It seems like now, which I don't really like to do. Sometimes you can mess your picture up too much in your head, not looking at your examples enough. And sometimes you can make your picture really good. <laughs> Staying in your head, not looking at your examples. See, you know, you just got, it's always like discovery, 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 you know. It's like, okay, you discover that. Wow, okay, now that's something else. Ooh, ah, ooh, you know, that kind of thing's happening all the time. 
Okay, and then I am going to be focusing on the glazes in the hand too. Taking a little bit of a cadmium yellow medium, cadmium yellow light, mixing it with a little white. And also I got some dirty color in here too that's dirtying it up. But just to keep it a glaze, I'm gonna use my finger to wipe some of it off. I don't want to use a rag because it'll wipe too much of it off, but I might have to use a rag. I think I am. And just kind of erase some of the tone back out. So I give it and I take it away. Okay, and then now I'm going to just blend some more of that uh, raw umber with burnt sienna right around this back end. Because now that I got some juicy wet on there, it's very thin because I dried it away, but it's wet enough to give me a nice blend effect here. I can actually do a little bit more uh, glazing inside of this finger. I think I'm going to carry some of that glazing into this finger too. Try to enhance colors that I already have in there without destroying any tones that I have in there, of course. Which that's a very, it's like a little dance that you, you do. You know, you don't want to destroy anything, but you want to enhance at the same time. So it's a back and forward, back and forward, back and forward. Try this, take away this, oops, maybe, not, okay, that's good, that's not, until you kind of come up with something, a, a good solution. Okay, that looks pretty good. Now I'm going to go back to that highlight that I originally made. And actually, this one is leaning towards yellow, so I'm going to make a new one. That has, it's got that peachy color. But it has just a little bit more yellow in it. It's basically white and yellow, mostly. And it's yellow light, mostly. Okay, and just add just a little smidge of that. Don't want too much of that, just a little bit of it. But I do want to go into some paint. So I might have to get another brush and just tap in. I think this is the right tone that's already on this brush. Just tap in just a little bit of flavor so I can have something to paint into and blend into when I come in here with this highlight. And there it is. Yeah. And glaze it in. Liking that. Okay. I don't want to take away what I've done. So I got to constantly kind of stop liking it, get my head up out of what I'm doing, and say, okay, what did you do there? Did you mess something up? <laughs> you know, did you change it too much? And if you did change it, did you make it better or did you make it worse? You know? So you kind of you kind of gotta like it. And almost just as quick as you would start to like it, you got to say, okay, be objective, you know, not like it as much, you know, so that you can not invest in messing it up, <laughs> but invest in making it better. Else what your next painting stroke is going to do is going to undo something that you meticulously spent trying, time trying to do. You don't want to do that. You don't want to undo. You want to just do. Okay. And see, so like this cut tone here is just too dark right there. And I'm, I don't need that. I mean, that's not helping me. And so I'm not, with this tissue, I didn't take it all out. I just broke it back so it's a very faint hint of a glaze. And now what I can do is just do a little bit of toning around that. And then I can come back in with another color. 
which is a lighter color. And I can kind of build, I can build around and into stuff. You know, just build around and into. Just with just little touches. These are just little touches of tone that I'm bringing in. Nothing really crazy, nothing too much loaded up on a brush. Just loading just a bare amount of tone sometimes and just glazing with that. Okay, now I've been kind of neglecting this finger here. I just want it looking kind of abstract. And it's very easy to get abstract with your painting when you're blending and you forget to blend. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to go back in with this same brush because it's the right size and it has a, a a tone close to what I need. I'm using it essentially as a blend brush anyway. And I'm going to start blending these separate tones around this ring here. Just building up the finger just a little bit more. The ring finger. Just building up the tones on that. Of course I'm having fun with this painting because I think there's another young lady that wants me to paint her painting, but you know, I start the paintings when you make that first payment. Then I will start stretching your canvas at that point because I keep supplies back in my other room, but that could be another painting. And then I have to go to the store and buy some more supplies. So I don't want to do that. So what I do is I wait until I get some type of commitment through payment. Then I'll start using my supplies to build structure. Structure Now, sometimes if I do an all ground like I did with this painting, it might take me, sometimes I say one week, but actually it took me three weeks to do this one, you know, because that's how much the oil needs to dry in my environment for my studio. Uh, it's just humid where I live. It's humid. And with humid environments, uh, things just dry slower. It kind of introduces itself and kind of break the shock in so it's not so shocking. So um, going back to the point of aliens, there's no such a thing as alien. Else we would, we would, would know, they would be a known thing by now. They'll be known. They won't be just known to Americans. They'll be known to even people in primitive places. They'll, they'll be going everywhere. But you notice the most people that seem to the know aliens tend to be, tend to be, especially the ones flying and flying saucers and stuff. People that have access to television and movies and stuff like that. I mean, there are some people who made artwork, but artwork in itself, I'm an artist can be very abstract. It can look like aliens. I mean, you could make any image. That don't, that's not proof of uh, aliens. That's just proof that somebody made some wonky artwork. <laughs> and that artwork was pretty wonky and it looked similar to something that you saw in the movies. But that don't necessarily mean that it is the thing that you think it is. That just means that it just looks similar to something that you think it might be. So that's my theory on aliens there. Is that uh, aliens happen because, because before people saw aliens, you know what they were seeing? Angels and demons and devils. But we're seeing that. I'm not saying that that stuff don't exist. I mean, because there is a spiritual world. So I'm not saying it doesn't exist. But the average person was seeing this pretty much regularly. And then as people got less religious, those kind of um, sightings subsided. It kind of stopped. Because they don't know anything. You know, there was a whole lot of information back in the day about religious iconography and imagery. When I say religious 
angels, demons, that people knew what they looked like. Artists had made paintings of them, even though they never seen them. They just made it up out their imagination. And then all of a sudden, whatever the imagery that was programmed in the head, at that time they didn't have movies, they had paintings, would start to surface. People would start to see exactly the image. It's just like people say the Virgin Mary. But didn't the artist paint a picture of the Virgin Mary? Do you think people back in the time of zero AD, you know, of course the, the, the calendar has been reset, you know, you know that the earth is not 2,000 years old. It started 2,000 when the Romans took over the world. When the Europeans came in, they, you know, that's why we call the place the Middle East. It's the middle way between Africa and Europe. <laughs> Everything is from a Euro, because it's actually West Asia. The Middle East, the place they call the Middle East, is actually West Asia. There's East Asia, that's the area of Japan and Korea and China. And then there's West Asia. That's the area of it, the place we call Israel, Palestine is what I call it. And Syria and Lebanon. So now... Since you have East Asia and West Asia, where well, the people don't look like they're Asians, but you know, the, the, the ethnicity of the people or the look of the people, vastly different, the culture of the people, vastly different. So, even though they're Asian, the original Asians were not people from China. Of course, Chinese called themselves before white people showed up, something completely different. They didn't call themselves Asian at all. Same thing with the Japanese and the Koreans. They began to call themselves, refer to themselves as Asian because, again, the people from Europe named them that. <laughs> you know? Uh, before they called people Africans, they called the people from Africa Ethiopians in the Bible. Of course, the year Constantine wrote that. And then at some later date, uh, after people was discovering some of the writings of the Romans, they, they found out the Romans called them Africans. So then these people, when coming over to conquer the African, they weren't really interested in trade at all. Who shows up trading with a bunch of cannon ships, swords on their, on their arms, on their hips? No, you don't, you don't show up with that stuff if you're going to trade. Traders show up with every piece of space on their vessel is designed to get money, to put something that they can trade and sell. They don't want to waste precious space with military paraphernalia because military paraphernalia can be very, very awkward and big and take up a lot of very precious cargo space in a trade ship. So if you're coming somewhere in a trade ship that's full of cannons, you're not coming to trade. You're coming to that country to rob, pillage, and destroy from the very get-go beginning. And it's just a deception to say you came to Africa to trade well, you were trying to get to India, but when you got there, you took over India too. And see, that sounds kind of bad because, okay, that, that's racist, but that's actually what happened. And so, for example, if Africans did that, I can't say that's racist, you know what I mean? A person can't say, well, this is what they did. Just like if, if an African was a slave, I might be ashamed of that. But it's what happened, you know? Your ancestors were slaves. There is no getting around that. No matter how much you don't want somebody to talk about it, it's a fact. It actually happened. And if you're the, the person, you're the descendant of the group that it came from, to be able to tell those people to stop talking about it, well, you can't stop talking about 9-11. You can't stop talking about being a good patriot. You can't stop talking about the effects of the Crusades, you know, basically. Uh, Islam and how bad that is. But you do want others to stop talking about 
what happened. You know, and a Jewish person, they're not going to stop talking about what happened in the Holocaust. They're going to constantly see references to that all in the movies everywhere. You know? And they did uh, go out themselves, hunted down the Nazis years after the fact, murdered them, killed them. I don't know if they murdered them, they got their revenge because these people were already murderers. So, I mean, you cannot tell a person whose ancestors were ravished this way to get over it. And then at the same time, you could drive down the street, go into the local 7-Eleven somewhere and pass John Q. Redneck's house. And he got his Confederate flag out and his Trump flag right beside his Confederate flag and his American flag right beside that one. So he ain't let go none of the Confederate stuff. Matter of fact, that's my heritage. My heritage in America. America, that's my heritage. Well, my heritage is reminding you of your heritage. <laughs> of jacking people up and being a Neanderthal about it. Being a daggone evil person. Since your heritage was evil people doing evil stuff to my ancestors, and you you don't have no problem putting your Confederate little statues out there and your little flag up. I mean, you're going down in 95 to go to Disneyland, take your kids to Disneyland somewhere. You know, you're going with your, with, your, with your parents or something, your grandparents. They got two, three generations of your family going down to Disneyland to see Mickey Mouse. Then on the way down to see Mickey Mouse, your little children, three and four and five years old, don't even know what life is like. See this big old flag, I mean the size of a daggone football field, flying through the air. And then they say, well, uncle so-and-so or daddy, whoever, what does that big old flag mean right there? <laughs> And then what do you got? What are you gonna say to them? Oh, don't worry about that. No, but that's a interesting looking flag. Okay, but this is what the flag means. And then they they hearing this for the first time. So you are trying to tell me you don't want to talk to them about it, but they continue to ask you. And then you see the look on their face. So you're trying to tell me that white people experience that with their children? You got that same you got that same experience in life. You got to explain to them that there was a whole group of people in this country that jacked your people up. <laughs> Matter of fact, they're still putting their flags up. Look, that's a, that little statue. And then look at the little child in elementary school. He's in elementary school. He, his parents ain't even there with him. He says a little black boy. And here's the history teacher telling him, yeah, they had him in boats and they brought him over and they whipped him. And they they did lynch. They lynched uh, little Nat Turner. Well, what was Nat Turner's problem? He didn't want to be a slave anymore. And they come home from school at what age they teach him at? Six, seven years old? Eight, maybe? And then they have to say, well, you know, they ain't going to ask the teacher that because they ain't that bold. The teacher just taught them that. So they got to check with the, you know, because dad lied to them about Santa Claus too. So they don't know who to check now, but they're going to check with dad. They don't already got you straight about the Santa Claus thing when you lied to them, and they caught you in that. So they said, how about this slavery thing? Tell me the truth. Don't be lying to me again like you did with Santa Claus. So then you got to go and say, look, man, they jacked our people up. <laughs> <All right. laughs> you know, who is they? The white folks did. Well, which ones? The ones in the South. Where we at now? <laughs> Uh, matter of fact, let's go on down the street and you see the little cannon and the cannonball still sitting in front of the plantation building. And it still look they got they still call it the place a plantation. You know? This 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 Trump uh Crump uh, park plantation, they done turned it into a park and everything. Well, then you go talk to the guide, you go, you take your children in there, right down the street where they got swing sets and ducks and everything. And the guy say, yeah, they're right there was the slave quarters. Then the kid look over in the field and see the little rows 
little little stuff there where the little agriculture was planted. And right over there, they could have using their imagination. That's where the slave quarters was kept. Okay, so that don't happen to white kids. And if they do, they, they learn it. They go with one ear and go right out the other ear. The difference is with a black kid, they internalize it because they got a daddy, they got a grandma, they have a great grandma, and they see, and then they, they notice things. So now, what happens in school is somebody say, call them a nigger. And they use that word. And they already got the skinny from mom and dad at home on it. And they, and they hit them in a weird way. So then the white people don't understand why. How come I can't call you one? Y'all do it in the rap songs. <laughs> well, he didn't experience that, but he feels it so a certain way, did he? And that's what you got to understand. It makes people feel a certain way. And you ain't going to feel that same way if you ain't those people that it happened to. I mean, you could imagine you could feel that way, but that's not your ancestors. That's not your people that was jacked like that. I mean, Alex Haley, when he played Roots for the first time on television, it was really funny. He played Roots. And then uh, black people ain't never seen no movie like that before with slaves in it. And it was very realistically done movie. I mean, the acting was excellent. Even the people that had to play the bad people, the acting, the acting was off the chain, especially for that time. It was just something was never seen before, you know, especially for black people. And because the history won't, it was always glossed. But then when Alex Haley wrote this book and made this movie, Hollywood didn't gloss none of that stuff up. That's one thing, that Holly, that's one movie Hollywood got right. They just told it bad and plain exactly the way it was. They just went in. <laughs> and uh, left it raw. And uh, the next, the, you know, in school, the kids didn't know, the black kids didn't know what to do. Because uh, especially if you now if you're in a school that's almost all black or almost all white, probably nothing happened. But if you're in a school like like I was in, it was about 60, 40, 50, 50, 35, 75, whatever. Uh, 35, 65, whatever. Uh, you had a different kind of, you know, people was looking at people weird the next day in school, let's put it that way. You know, he was saying, you know, uh, first of all, the teachers never taught this. And they made a movie about it, and it just resonated. It hit home. And you realize the teachers didn't teach it right. They glossed it over. And the movie just told it wrong. So I remember I was, um, I was in a class, a history class, in elementary school for a family member. It was like the parent-teacher conference day. And I said, you know, how come, um, you know, in ancient Egypt, this African culture, you know, they had these kind of, you know, I, I noticed that you had people saying that this is when this particular kind of uh, Doric column and the Corinthian column was first invented in Greece. I said, well, they had columns made from the lotus that was actually in ancient Egypt, Africa, where that's native, some of these things are native to there, and it's not native to the Greeks or the Romans. But you taught my ancestor, or my, uh, <laughs> not my ancestor, my, uh, my person there, that this was developed in uh, Greece, and then the Romans adopted it. And I said, that's not true. And I said, well, who, uh, who is responsible for your curriculum? And they said, well, he said, I know. The teacher said, I know um, that about Egypt. Matter of fact, I said, how come you don't teach nothing about Egypt? It's just a little, it's a little paraphrase. It's a little glip. They teach a little something, but it's like a one paragraph. Well, you got thousands, tens of thousands of years of history. They give you one little paragraph about Africa. I mean, they don't even teach you nothing about Western Africa, but about Egypt. 
They don't teach you jack zip about Western Africa. You don't learn one thing about that. Well, most of the people in America, you know, a lot of the people that the most homogeneous or a large swath of American culture is African. <laughs> Let's put it that way. They have one thing in common, that's West Africa. And there's maybe not one nation, but it's definitely one region. And so that region shares certain parallels. And so you don't teach one of those cultural parallels to African Americans. And even though 60 million African Americans is in this country, and then not to mention Caribbean Americans and, you know, adding that into the equation as well. And then not to mention also Hispanic Americans that might also have Native American and African ancestry, some as well as European. So you mean to tell me that that's just going to get ignored and all those people don't count when it's supposed to be 27% of Americans supposed to be uh, Hispanic or I'm just not going to use the word Hispanic because that's a man-made construct too because for uh, 1492 there was no Hispanics. There was Native Americans, there was Africans, and there was Europeans. <laughs> so where in the world did the Hispanic come from? I don't know. But, but when you combine all those people together, it creates, you don't want to say mulatto, you don't want to say mosquito, they got all these words for it, but I don't care what it is. You know, if you do your DNA test, you're going to find that not all your junk come from the Iberian Peninsula. <laughs> not all your stuff come from Spain or Portugal. Quite a bit of your stuff coming from Africa. Quite a bit of it is coming from Native Americans. Quite a bit of it. And so how come we don't teach that history with the same fervor that we teach the European history. Well, when you're trying to erase a group of people, you're not going to teach that history because you want that group of people to go away. Let's just face it. You really want them to go away. They don't go away. They think they're really supposed to be a part. You know, they, they really do believe that we're a part of this thing and uh, we're, we're players, you know. But everything in this culture, the American culture says, in terms of the political, the real things that happen. I'm not talking about the felt things. I'm talking about the real things that happen. Everything says, go away. Let's forget you. Everything says that. Almost nothing says, let's remember you. That goes for the Native American as well as the African. So you're trying to get rid of those groups. That's what, you're, that's what the overall goal, because this is issued from the government. These are the people that control your department of education. And hold it, these are supposed to be elected officials. These are not no deep state. So we're going to have to start holding our elected officials accountable. That's just all to it. Everybody say, it don't matter. Your vote don't count. Yes, your vote do. Email. Get on the telephone. They all have telephone numbers. Call. Let people know I want the Justice Department reform. I'm tired of seeing people getting choked down on social media in front of my eyeballs. My kids watching it. My grandkids watching it. My nephews, my nieces. If, well, you know, I don't know what you got. You know, my mama, my daddy, everybody watching this stuff. I don't want to see one more incident. And I know there's some bad jokers out there for the police. There's some bad jokers out there. They're doing bad things. And the police get called and they have to respond to some jokers. But again, uh, they have bad jokers in Japan. They got bad jokers in England, Germany. Hold it. The police in those places don't walk around with guns. How do they control that? How do they control the bad jokers? I mean, bad jokers is not just amongst African Americans. It's not just amongst Americans. 
is in almost every country. There's a bad joker. See, they have a different way of handling it that does not involve killing someone. <laughs> Executing them on the street. And then calling the ambulance to pick up the body after the fact. I mean, that's some barbarianism. That's what that's called. That's called barbarianism. That's not a highly evolved civilization. I know because we have money in this country. See, and a lot of times people associate money with intelligence. Money with, with, with being right. Money with being blessed by God. Let's just go to that level with it. Because a lot of times people think, I must be right. God is having good. But God blessed the slave master too now. Well, all of the black people that think, I'm blessed by God. Now, he a lot of people say, God blesses me, brother. Okay? Well, God blessed the master too. Was he right? <laughs> Enslaving your ancestors? Because he was surely one of the most wealthy people in your county. He surely was somebody who enjoyed a high level of luxury. Most definitely a very, very high level of the comforts and the joys of life. And that dude lived a good long time, smiling and happy, traveling the world, and he up on the Lucifer Britannia and the Titanic and everything. Yes, Jibs, uh, do you have a cup of tea? And then at the same time, they just lay in that whip into your dag on the ancestors' back. <laughs> like, it ain't nobody's business, man. They just going in on the bro. You know? Without mercy, even. And then get a nice funeral, go on to heaven. And of course, what the slave is going to do, he's going to just get a little cheap funeral out there under the tree somewhere, throw him over in the ditch somewhere, because he ain't got no money. And then after that, uh, he going to heaven and be right with the dude that sent him to heaven by boiling him alive in the dang on oil. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Forever and ever and ever. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he going straight in it. And maybe the same white folks is up there in heaven. And since it's the white people that induce you to heaven, they going to be in charge and you're going to still be you ain't going to African heaven, man. You going to white folks heaven, man. <coughs> oh, is there, is there several heavens? I mean, I thought it was just one heaven, but that's the one they talk about in the Bible. Everybody else don't have heaven. Well, I don't know, man. You know, ask somebody. <laughs> <coughs> ask somebody what, what's going on. Don't just be into one or the other. Ask somebody what's going on was going down so so you can figure something out you know because clearly uh some stuff ain't 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 resolved in terms of the logics you know because a lot of times you and people can make a lot of stuff work 